Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Coast Connections. Before we begin, I just want to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Sinemuk First Nation, and also of the, the chosen home of the Mid-Island Métis Nation. And we are very proud that we are able to live and work and enjoy this beautiful part of the world. When we speak about Indigenous people in Canada, it includes the First, First Nations people, the Métis, and also the Inuit. And I myself don't know much at all about the Métis culture, and I thought we would take this opportunity to educate me <laughs> about uh, what it is to be Métis in Canada. And to do that, we have the pleasure of Joy Bremner. Welcome, Joy. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Joy, you are an elder and a knowledge keeper for yes. the Métis people here mm -hmm. on the island. I am, and you know, and one of the, the explanations instantly that comes to mind then, elder was not a typical Métis word. Mm -hmm. And so we were called knowledge keepers or the old ones. And so it's interesting as I've aged, I'm not offended when I'm addressed as one of the old ones. Oh, so it's great. interesting. <laughs> of course, the term elder is a colonial term, and so it was right. not one of ours. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and it's mm -hmm. an interesting piece, and it's very respectful to be mm -hmm. called what we're used to, of course. Yes. And I thank you for, for, you know, addressing me as an elder and knowledge keeper. It's My pleasure. Yeah. Joy, just to start off, what actually defines a person as being Métis? Okay. And again, you know, our history goes back many, many years in, in this country. For instance, my own, the very first blending of the two cultures, both European and First Nations, was in the late 1600s with a Sioux woman. And then, of course, then they moved on, traveled as they were following the beaver and the bison across the country, went through many other nations. You know, the Ojibwe, there's an Ojibwe, a couple of Ojibwe women in my background, and then a few Cree women as well. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it's in both sides of my family, both my mother and father were both Métis. And so, yeah, it's, it's a long history and, and not always a group, mm -hmm. a welcome comfortable history either mm -hmm. you know but at the same time we are doing what we do and coming through truth and reconciliation has thrown a bit of a you know many of us didn't look at the truth of what's gone on even for the Métis themselves right. you know and it can be very triggering at times and, and you know residential school did impact many of our families mm -hmm. and the 60s scoop as well and I think one of the things that brings a lot of pleasure in and takes us to a better place is as we look at the cultural items and the things that we did coming forward from that mm -hmm. and it's always interesting because the women wore very dark drab colors and clothes we decorated our men <laughs> <laughs> well and, now <laughs> well now i know and you know and we were a matriarchal society mm -hmm. and so you know as we've gone forward though now the women are you know, looking at ribbon skirts and, and a variety of different things. I tend to be a little more subtle still, but I like the odd bit of color. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, do bead, porcupine quill work, even some moose hair tufting. And yeah. Can I just show the viewers this porcupine yes. quill work that uh, Joy has done? Um, inside there are porcupine quills and on the bottom from a porcupine that... Um, was salvaged uh, as part of some roadkill. But look at that, how beautiful that is, Joy. Mm -hmm. And who taught you how to bead? And again, you know, because, uh, you know, on the prairies, you know, my family was known as half-breeds, mm -hmm. not necessarily Métis, because we weren't close to Métis communities. And that's not a term we would ever use anymore, no, is it, Joy? No, no, yeah. And even on some of the, the script papers that some of my older relatives had, they were simply named as half-breeds, not mm -hmm. Métis. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so that piece of we always, you know, my mother tended to, you know, migrate to those sorts of areas even when we went into t small towns and things like that and and because she was comfortable with that and so it was always all around and you know and it's always interesting I think I the only thing I can claim my 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 grandmother really taught me was how to make baked bannock <laughs> and the experience of beaver tails which was our fry bread across the prairies mm. right so yeah how lovely. Yeah. <laughs> and you were mentioning that one of your favorite recipes is... Um, Porcupine balls. 
<laughs> the look on your face when I said yeah. that one was perfect. And it's actually one I see quite often, yeah. you know. And, Do and it, tell. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's actually balls that are m made with, with bison meat mm -hmm. and wild rice in them. Mm. Then the wild rice sticks out as though it's a porcupine and there's quills in it. So <laughs> I know some, some people like to put a gravy on it, but then the porcupine image disappears. So I prefer yeah. without gravy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand that. Yes. And yeah. um, the bison is mm -hmm. a very, very um, integral part of the Métis yes. history and culture, it isn't is. it, Joy? Yeah. Tell us, tell us a little bit about the significance of the bison. You know, and, you know, as the beaver, and again, you know, a part of when the Europeans came, one of the things that began to happen across our country, because they were taking so much back to their own continent and their own countries. Mm. We started seeing, you know, a drop in the population of the beaver, which was a really important aspect when they came here. And I'll do that one before the, the bison. So what was more appreciated by the Europeans and the traders was to purchase what was called made beaver. And what that was, was beaver that had been worn by the Métis or the First Nations. So the long hairs on the beaver pelt was worn off because when they were taking them back to Europe, they were using that then the softness of that beaver that was left to make their felt hats, oh. you know? And so who'd have imagined a very worn beaver hide was worth way more than a fresh one. So, but again, you know, as that population started to diminish somewhat and then the reality of looking at the bison mm -hmm. and, you know, it's like, and we know there were very thousands and thousands of bison on the North American content, continent. And yeah, it's, you know, the hunt of those, you know, and even the Métis when they were doing it on their own, of course. And I don't have a uh, sample of a small Red River cart or anything. I don't know if you've ever heard one, a full-size one. They are so loud. The Red and River cart? creak and mm. groan, and it's amazing. Mm. And so when they would go on their hunting trips and things like that, there could be many of those carts. And of course, then, then they would stop quite a ways from where the bison herds were because the noise would scare them away, sure. of course. Mm -hmm. And so the women would set up the teepees and the camps and all of that, and the men would go off to do their hunts. And there were various ways in which they did that, right? And of course, the prairie isn't completely flat, mm -hmm. as many people like to believe. So there were, it's the odd cliff or valley or things like that that then enabled that. And then we also, you know, start to move into the sash because the sash was quite important on the hunt. The women, Métis women, finger wove their sashes mm. and we all had our own family colors. And now there are hundreds of different formats and patterns of the sashes now as you go forward for various reasons. But they used to be incredibly wide. They'd be like this wide. So if the men wore them around their, their, their waist or whatever, they could carry things, fold them and carry things inside them. But also it was a great way if a, a, a male Métis had actually hunted and that bison was his, he would leave his sash on it because the family had identifiable sashes. And so his women from his family would know that that was theirs. To mark, mm. to mark the kill. Yeah, and you then know. respectfully that was left alone. Yeah, they by others. It was, yeah. yeah, it belonged to that family. Wow. And then the women and the children, of course, would go and do a lot of the butcherina and mm -hmm. all of that. And nothing was not used. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was when you start to think of there was not a store probably for five or six hundred miles. And then it was just a trade store. So there weren't many supplies no. and no grocery stores. So that wasn't a, lineups weren't an issue at the store <laughs> when you needed food, right? So yeah, so they would do all sorts of things and the curing and, and pemmican, of course, was the dried bison meat. And, mm -hmm. and very often they like to put, you know, wild blueberries or something like that in it, just to flavor it somewhat. Mm -hmm. And I know I, I knew a family that um, probably, what was it, 30 years ago, when they were clearing some of their, their property in northern Saskatchewan, they actually uncovered an old bag of pemmican mm. and it still smelt fine seemed fine but nobody dared try to taste it no. <laughs> <laughs> you could 
maybe make some moccasins out of it yes. or something, yes. <laughs> something a little more durable like yeah. that. Now, Joy, we've been talking about bison and blueberries mm -hmm. and um, um, that represents a different part of Canada, obviously. Yes. Yes. So where are the Métis people from? Um, and so our homeland, you Canada. know, yeah, our, we did have what was called the Métis homeland. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was a small portion of, of Ontario and some of the Northwest Territories and a bit of the states across North Dakota and Montana. But basically it was uh, Manitoba, Saskatchewan and Alberta and a small sliver of Northern BC. Mm -hmm. And that was our homeland. And, and we had many different communities and, and properties. And I mean, my own family comes from the Red River Valley in Manitoba and which many of us have connection, direct connection to that. Mm -hmm. And then as various things happened, as you know, the Canadian government was after the land, because when you look at it on the prairies, you would always, they, they did that like these long, narrow plots of land. They start on the river and go off and back because you have to have water. And there's not a lot of water in lots of areas of the of the mm -hmm. prairies, unfortunately, not fresh like that. And so then when we were removed from our lands, and I mean, I think I have numerous script papers of relatives in my lineage going back, and they were removed and, and supposedly paid for that property. And quite often, unfortunately, it could take up to 10, 12 years, and sometimes never would they receive the money. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as then they were not allowed to own land, you know, you'll hear tales. There are a few people on Vancouver Island, even older Métis, that were raised on the road allowance across the prairies. On the road allowance? Allowance, yes. So on the side the hides, of the roadway, yes. yeah. after being displaced from their property, from their yeah. property, yeah, they were living... Yes, and so they would, you know... In the ditches. In the ditches, effectively, yeah. You know, and, and that's an interesting thing. That's how young Canada is, still is. Yes. When, you know, I have friends uh, of a certain age that were raised on the road allowance. And unfortunately, you know, they would be off hunting or whatever and come back. And, of course, the, the government or agents of the government would have destroyed their homes. As flimsy as they may have been, they would destroy that. And so they would move on to a different area and a different road allowance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so it, it's a long history of really struggles, mm -hmm. you know, and because we really were on the move all the time, mm -hmm. you know, and we are quite so different than the First Nations. And their story is as difficult or worse because they were placed on reserves. We, that option was not a part of the Métis history, you know. So there we were traveling and many went up further north into the bush and built cabins and survived back then like that, mm -hmm. you know. And so it, it's, you know, there's times when it can be quite, quite triggering when mm -hmm. we start to talk about that, especially with people that experience a lot of that in mm -hmm. those ways. You know, and as we're coming through with truth and reconciliation, I think for some of us, it takes longer to face the truth. And so the reconciliation as we go forward is there are things that need to be acknowledged. And there has to be actions that are taken to, you know, help the recovery of the First Nations, the Inuit and the Métis, mm -hmm. because it was not them that chose to do those things. They, they were forced to, into those sorts of situations. And, you know, and then, it, you know, as we, with the First Nations women in my background, of course, and being married in the custom of the land, which essentially was the First Nation custom of, you know, they, they were given gifts by, by the male and then they would marry their daughter. And, you know, and even some of that was not a, a healthy relationship, mm -hmm. you know, for those women. But others actually managed to do quite well. And mm. depending on, you know, who their their new husband was, right. you know, it's a difficult time. So mm -hmm. we can understand a lot of that and facing that and then moving forward. And so now the Métis, you know, they did many different things to survive. Mm -hmm. You know, my mother moved 
many, many times. And that was, you know, a part of, of, you know, carrying forward those traumas that had been, you know, experienced by her and, and her, her mother and, and, you know, my, uh, my grandmother's relatives and, you know. But yeah, and then as we come forward, because I know I like to reflect on that the women generally wore very drab clothes. <laughs> uh, my grandmother, unfortunately, well, fortunately for her, her mother, which, uh, you know, was much closer to the being the First Nations, didn't know how to sew. Mm -hmm. So my grandmother grew up in flower gunny sacks. Mm -hmm. And all her mother knew what to do was to cut out the neck so her head would fit in and cut out the arms. And so my grandmother on her own taught herself to sew like crazy. And again, that then became a part of who she was and what we remember her for Beautiful. is her sewing skills were yeah. incredible, mm -hmm. you know. And that was just because, you know, of how hard it was for her to be wearing those gunny sacks. Yes. But and she was not alone. There were many back then, right? So that's, that's hard to fathom. Yeah. Um, speaking of fabric, I'm just going to break the, uh. Uh, just behind <laughs> you over your shoulder there, Joy. Yes. If you can just pull that sash. Because oh, um, yes. when we were getting ready for the show, you mentioned that this, tell us about this very unique sash and how it is so Métis. And it is, you know, because basically the Métis families would have their own sashes and now you can get colors. You can actually order your own family sashes to be made now professionally. Mm -hmm. And this one was created by the, the National Women's Group, the LFMO, and it's actually because so many of us had a scotch as a part mm -hmm. of our blended family. So it's a uh, Métis tartan to actually represent and honor that half of our, our you know, nationality and who we have evolved from. Yeah. And it's beautiful. It's gorgeous. It was quite Métis shocking. Tartan. Yeah, I, I didn't know. know there was such a thing. It's just they just come out with it this fall, yeah. or I guess it was this summer. I, I received it when I was at Batoche mm -hmm. for the summer celebration. So, yeah. And it also uh, represents um, what the Métis flag represents. Yes. With the yeah. Tell us what the symbol is on the Métis flag. And so the infinity symbol. Now, did you want to hold There's, one up or they know that? The okay. mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so, and, and, you know, depending on, you know, at times it, it was, you know, referred to simply a, of we're of mixed blood, mm -hmm. you know. And I really look towards we're of mixed culture. Right. And, you know, and it is forever. And that's why the infinity symbol is used on both our blue and our red flags. Mm -hmm. You know, and depending on what province or where you're from, that might be either blue or red, right? So, yeah. And it also speaks to how we are all connected. Yes. Um, not just as humans, but with the natural world as well. Yes. It's all one and yeah. uh, it's a beautiful symbol to have. It is. And, um, I also notice on some of the, the jig um, costumes, yes. or regalia that uh, the Métis wear, that those symbols are also on there. Yes. yes. And I just want to, we've got a beautiful clip here, Joy, okay. of the children learning to, to jig yes. as, in a way of trying to recapture and protect and preserve your culture. Yes. One, two, kick. One, two, kick. One, two, kick. One, two. And now you're going to point your foot forward. Point. 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 Good. Switch. 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 And then you're going to kick again. So kick. One, two. Kick. One, two. Kick. One, two. Now point to the sides. Side. Side. And like switch like this. Side. Side. Side, side, side. Good. Now kick again. Yeah, and so, you know, and it is a great, great video. You know, my granddaughter was doing the teachings, and it was um, the Cathers family, their three youngsters that were learning. And we were along the mill stream and Bowen Park, I guess. And it was just excellent and, you know, a, a good time. And we had Pet and Pete. Uh, no. Yeah. Ed Peekacoop right. was our fiddler, yes. And so, yeah. And the and fiddle is very much a part of your, your culture, yes. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. 
yeah. you know, and I don't know a lot about it other than that it's slightly in a different key. Mm -hmm. Is why it's a fiddle, not a not a violin. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, beautiful. Yeah, um, and the other things that uh, you're doing mm -hmm. uh, here on the Mid Island Métis Nation, as well as across Canada, there's about six hundred and fifty thousand Métis people who self-identify in there Canada. Are, yeah, yeah, ma many of them. There's like sixteen th over sixteen thousand of us on Vancouver Island. Okay. You know, and even within our own area of Mid Island, there is well over 4,000 of us. Mm -hmm. And those are just those that have identified. Right. Because many choose not to even now, right? Because so, of, of the racism yeah, that yeah. Yeah, is affected. You know. What I'm very impressed with, Joy, mm -hmm. is how you are working um, to revive your culture and yeah. pre preserve and protect it. You showed me this lovely series of booklets yes. that um, you've made. Yes. Talking about all different aspects of the Métis mm -hmm. culture, the yeah. food, the transportation, the music, yes. the, uh, the bison, yeah. and passing this down, mm -hmm. um, not only to other Métis people, but for you know, people like me to learn yeah. about this. And these are all available through the Mid-Island Métis Nation Yeah. Uh, for us that want to learn a little bit more. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a wonderful way because you yourself were deprived of your culture yes. in so many, many ways. Yeah that you too are learning, mm -hmm. aren't you, as you're yes. sharing. Yeah. So it's wonderful that we're sort of on this journey together, yes. learning from each other and about yeah. each other. Um, and um, I just think this is a, a wonderful way to begin, especially for someone like myself who has not been exposed um, to Métis right. culture yeah. um, very again, much at when all. When you think of it, because we were not on the coast so much for so mm -hmm. long, not in anything like these numbers, but eventually, you know, as we moved across the country, because we really did not have our own homeland any longer, no. you know, so yeah, yeah, it's... And Louis Riel tried to have a homeland he did, um, yes. <laughs> for yes. the Métis Nation, yeah. the Métis people. And we all know how badly that ended yes. with him being hanged yeah. for high treason when he was yeah. only 41 years old. Yeah. I think he was only 25 when he um, started the um, yes. militia yeah. there. You know, and it's interesting enough, a uh, 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 great, great, great grandfather of mine, John Bruce, was actually the leader of the Métis Nation, and Louis was his secretary. Wow. And then John Bruce actually suffered some some health concerns in that so then mm -hmm. he he encouraged louis to step forward and take it on because he was a much younger man so that's right in your family yes yeah. yeah. see that is such recent history it is that's incredible yeah 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 so yeah. louis riel the father of manitoba the leader of the metis nation mm -hmm. and it's nice to know that you know um has he been pardoned I'm not sure. And has. I'm not sure where that stands yeah. now either. You know, there is a huge effort. And again, when um, essentially when countries are invaded and, mm -hmm. and their, their original population it, it is, you know, dis, dispersed across the country and no longer connected. That happens around the world. Yeah, it does. You know, unfortunately. And so it can take a long time for actions to rectify that mm -hmm. in terms of the history, mm -hmm. for sure. Joy, we have to talk about oh, this yes. incredible Hudson Bay <laughs> coat that you brought in. It's probably 500 years old. It's like it's quite it, old, and it's heavy. It, it weighs is. probably 20, 25 pounds. <laughs> I know. Um, that is a striking piece of uh, it work. It is very much so, and, oh. and I was lucky to to receive it from one of our our male uh, old ones mm -hmm. before he had passed. So that, I was very fortunate. It was interesting when the Hudson Bay Company came to Canada. Take a guess at the color of the wool blankets they brought. Well, gee, no, no, they were dark blue. And now in Canada, across the prairies, as we had a lot of snow, you stand out in it. Is not a favorable color whatsoever. Oh. So yeah, so then they brought this one over after that. And so then it became very common for the women to be sewing them and, mm. you know, putting them together because it's incredibly warm, mm. you know. And yeah. is that sheep's wool that these um, were made of or is you know, it buffalo fur? I'm, no, I think it would be sheep's, I believe, yeah. because they come from Europe. So I would believe that that's what it is. Yeah. And I know uh, myself and another uh, old one, we were in, uh, I believe, the one of the parades, one fall 
and it was pouring rain and we were in a convertible, of course, <laughs> on the island. And we both had these on with our hoods up oh. and we were toasty warm. Oh, wow. So, yes. Beautiful. And, and that, of course, the Hudson Bay Company speaks yes. to the fur trade, yes. like the beaver that you yeah. spoke of and the bison. Yes. So yeah. completely uh, goes back to the Métis history here in it Canada. It does. You know, yeah. and even when you, you think of the bison, and I know there are numerous photos out around you might come across in terms of the piles of bison bones. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things, once you let those be um, taken care of by the wildlife on, laying on the prairies, mm -hmm. and you put them together, and bone china was a very large thing in Europe. Wow, and that was made of bison bone? Bison bone, uh, various bones they used over time. But what a, uh, they hit a gold mine wow. with bones at that point, yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. The, there's so many aspects of, of what has occurred that, you know, unless you're living around those that mm -hmm. know and have been and or are willing to share. Mm -hmm. Joy, we have to wrap up. We've got yes. about a minute left. This has been just so fascinating <laughs> listening to you. The beautiful moccasins mm -hmm. that you've brought in, those yes. are ones that you've actually made yourself. Yes, yeah. And they're just beautiful works of art. Yes. Your beautiful um, Hudson Bay, Hudson Bay mitts. mitts with the um, deer horn yeah, buttons, deer horn buttons yeah. and the beadwork that you yeah. have there. It's just beautiful. I just am so... Definitely, if we can have a quick look at this one. Let's have a quick look. Because the Métis were known as the flower beadwork people mm -hmm. because, you know, we learned embroidery from the nuns. And then when beads came, we were still doing all of the, the flower beadwork. And the five petal is the prairie rose. Oh. Yeah. That's the symbol of the Métis Nation, yeah. too, isn't yeah. it? Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Joy, any closing words that you have for us as we just wrap up here today? First of many conversations, I hope, yes. Joy, yeah. as we uh, learn from each other here. Definitely. You know, and we certainly... Your Michif language, how, how would you say... Um, Teach me a couple of closing words in Michif. Uh, okay, so, uh, say Tanchakia. Tanchakia. And that's, hello, how are you? And <laughs> Tanchakia, wow. oh, I'm fine. Hello, Tanchikiwa. back in, Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, fine. I'm fine. Hello, and I'm fine. Mm -hmm. Yes. And how do we say thank you for joining us on Coast Connections? And <laughs> <laughs> now you can either use, you know, as the Michif language is quite often a joining of the French as well. Mm -hmm. So merci, merci or miigwech. Or miigwech? Miigwech. Miigwech. Yeah. Merci or miigwech. Yeah. Well, I know two more words than there I did you coming go. in today, yes. Joy. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a joy. Oh, thank you. To have you here. You're just uh, a lovely person to no. listen to. Your Thank voice you. is just, it's like having story time here on ah, the set. There we go. And uh, I look forward to more conversations with you about this as we learn more together and yeah. um, help others to, you know, spark some curiosity yes. as well. We certainly fit a lot in. So thank you mm. <laughs> for the opportunity. Marcy. <laughs> <laughs> and Marcy, to you, thank you for joining us here on Coast Connections with Elder and Knowledge Keeper, Métis Joy Bremner. Thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.